Now a reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke. Listen for the word of God. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these, Jesus said, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. President McMillan, Provost Chapdelaine, Dean Krantz, Members of the faculty, members of the administration, parents, family, friends, and students. I've been waiting a long time to get that row right now. <laughs> it is a joy for me to be here in Memorial Chapel. I spent most of my life while a student here at Albright in this building, either in this room in concert choir or downstairs in religion classes. It is great to return here. I was in this room 30 years ago and felt the weight of a hood put on my neck and received a degree and commenced from this place. At that time, uh, the chaplain of the college was Dr. Charles Urigan, who is here today. I was here today without him. In fact, all of this in my mind takes me back to a time when I attended here at Albright just a handful of years ago, the annual awards dinner. And that year, the alumni of the year gave a small speech in which he used a rock-solid metaphor called the beneficence of chance. I thought to myself, he might have better chose the benevolence of chance. It has a way of rolling better off the tongue. The benevolence of chance, he spoke of his life here at Albright College. All of those benevolent moments of the people that he met who helped to shape him and make him who he is today. And I've never forgotten that metaphor. In the benevolence of chance, 30 years ago, Dr. Urigan was here. He was to commence from this place, to go on in the United Methodist Church to, to serve for 24 years as the General Secretary of our General Commission on Archives and History. By the benevolence of chance, he is now, with his wife, Jean, parishioners at the church I serve in Lancaster at First Church, the benevolence of chance. Also here today as a part of my family is Dr. John McElhenney, who served as a baccalaureate preacher here and received the Doctor of Divinity degree. I actually met him here in this building downstairs at an impromptu surprise birthday party for Dr. Urigan. We don't really remember meeting each other that day, but in less than a decade, I was appointed by my bishop to serve as the associate pastor at the United Methodist Church in Westchester, where Dr. McElhenney was the senior pastor, and we had four marvelous years together. And by the benevolence of chance, he and his wife, Nancy, 
are now active members at First United Methodist Church in Lancaster. <laughs> my mother is here today. She was here in this room with my father 30 years ago this weekend when I too took that hood and that degree and commenced and went off. And our father was here too. 20 years ago this weekend, we lost him suddenly. 10 years ago, my brother Jeff became artist in residence this weekend here at Albright College. And one year ago, my wife took a chance after leaving a career of 24 years at a local hospital system in the Lehigh Valley, she struck out and started a new business in a time of an economic upheaval and by the benevolence of chance, all is going well. And I'm so proud of her. My sister is here today, my adorable sister Carol. She too is a graduate of Albright College. She is now married to a young man that she was interested in dating and my father took him golfing. And that was the night my father passed away. And Jason tried to save his life. And by the benevolence of chance, they are now married. The youngest of our three children are here, Tracy. She did not choose to come to Albright. <laughs> More is the pity, she went to Moravian College in Bethlehem. We have two other children who are older. I banned them from coming today, President, because they threatened to organize something called a flash mob <laughs> during my sermon, which I thought was imprudent and unwise, so they're not allowed to come. We do have a nephew. His name is Tate. He will be 11 years old in three days, and I'm hoping my sister will go home and say to him the words that Jesus said to the lawyer a few minutes ago about Albright College, go and do likewise. I can't think of a more useless profession for you today than a preacher. I really can't. I mean, what do you need a preacher for? But here we are together, and I'm so happy to be here. I actually examined baccalaureate sermons in the past. Mine, fortunately, is not in Latin. I went back as far as the very early 19th century and into the 20th century, looking at high pulpit churches and universities for baccalaureate sermons, they are very moralistic. I think in many ways unhelpful. The best, of course, were at divinity schools, which makes sense. Divinity school students should hear good preaching, but not moralistic preaching. And that's mostly what students heard. A couple of weeks ago, I was intrigued that a list of the 10 things that your commencement speaker will not tell you tomorrow went viral. I read that list of 10 things. I didn't think they were so bad. Perhaps commencement speaker Spitz will use them tomorrow. I don't know. But I have put together the 10 things that your baccalaureate preacher is not afraid to tell you. <laughs> I think I might be able to do my David Letterman impression. I wish Paul Schaefer was here. That would go better. So let's try it, shall we? The 10 things your baccalaureate preacher is not afraid to tell you. Number 10, life is hard. But it isn't as hard as experimental psych, apparently. <laughs> I read an article by Molly Ivan. She's now passed. She was a Texas-born journalist, a rough-leathered, skinned kind of woman, a formidable woman. And she took experimental psych at her college in Texas. On the first day of class, she was handed a box and a rat and told that sometime during the semester she was supposed to teach this rat how to touch a lever so that a pellet of food would fall down so that the rat would learn how to feed itself. She had a very brilliant rat. It learned right away. But then the test changed. And the rat, apparently in the language of experimental psych, overlearned, kept hitting the lever one time, never learned to hit it twice to get the next pellet. Apparently the rat died somewhere in the middle of the semester and she said it was a useless class. Until as a journalist, she went to the Pentagon in the late 1980s when the Berlin Wall fell down and she observed diplomats and uh, other Pentagon sorts sitting at their computers doing exactly what the rat had done when it was frustrated that it couldn't eat. Apparently they threw their heads back, turned three times around in their chair, fell on the floor and had a tantrum that the Cold War was over. Well, life is hard. But there are harder things than the life that you are about to live. You will discover that. Number nine, raise heck 
and kick butt as often as you can. Can I say hell and ass here? Raise hell and kick ass, the president said, I could say. <laughs> At the General Conference of the United Methodist Church that just happened this past April, the latter days of April into May, there was complete failure of nerve to help the largest Protestant mainline denomination change the course of its life and its character, its, its ethos. We couldn't decide how to restructure ourselves to revitalize our mission, and we couldn't even agree together to state in our book of discipline, it's not a book of spanking, it's a book of learning really how to discipline ourselves against the means of grace, we couldn't even put in legislation that admitted that as a denomination we are a multi-personality disordered people on the issue of homosexuality. And so there were people there who raised hell and kicked butt, and that's what you ought to do, I think, with your life as often as you can. Number eight, you must live your life, live your life, live your life. Those were the last words that Maurice Sendak spoke to an NPR reporter in one of the last interviews he ever did. Maurice Sendak just died a week or so ago. He was the man who wrote the book, Where the Wild Things Are. He was a curmudgeon. He really hated people, but he loved children. <laughs> he had a way of reminding people that he had lived such a difficult life but yet, living your life is the only thing that you can do. Number seven, if you should surreptitiously find yourself on the sidewalk of your town's main street during a Ku Klux Klan march, do the decent thing, will you, and moon them as they go by? <laughs> I mean, really, this is one of the top ten things that I'm not afraid to tell you. Get every member in your family, your parents, your grandparents, your cousins, your neighbors, your children, line them all up, moon them as they go by in succession, look like a wave at a baseball stadium, and you will totally, totally mess up the whole KKK march. You graduates are the graduates from Arab Spring. Citizenship in this nation doesn't come by apathetically sitting back and waiting for someone else to make decisions for you. For God's sake, get out there and do something, something to change the world. I would hasten to add, please don't do anything to make the world any worse, but get out there and do something good. <laughs> Number six, you, you can't make yourself less afraid by making yourself less free. You'll, you'll just be less free. For the last 100 years, we have been a people as a nation, and now this contagion has spread globally. We are a people of high anxiety and fear. We had a fear of communism, for example, that has turned into a fear of terrorism. Please don't do that to yourselves. Don't limit your freedom in your mind or in your heart or in your spirit. Number five, have a boatload of fun, won't you? So that as you get down toward the end of the road of your life, you will be able to look back and say, look what fun I had. Number four, get outside. Get outside into nature and find bigger places to spend than your own ego. Number three, traveling faster limits your field of vision. Nipun Mehta of servicespace.org just delivered a baccalaureate sermon just a few days ago at the University of Pennsylvania. He talked about the thousand kilometer walk he and his wife took together in India, they sold everything that they had and learned that by walking through your life rather than running through your life, your field of vision actually expands, you're able to take more in. That sounds like something no one should be afraid to tell you. Number two, soon you're going to meet life head on and when you do, instead of covering your eyes and screaming, may I suggest that you open up your palms and accept life as it comes to you with a good measure of acceptance. And now, number one, the number one thing your baccalaureate preacher is unafraid to tell you is this. Make your verbs become flesh. You don't know it, but I've just pulled you into a homiletical loop, because here's where the sermon is going to begin. There is nothing in the text from the Gospel according to St. Luke that I read to you that suggests that the lawyer in the narrative is an intentionally adversarial person toward Jesus, though he is often portrayed this way in many interpretations and sermons. 
To be sure, the Greek word for test may also be translated as tempt, but the demeanor of the lawyer and Jesus' own willingness to engage him in conversation suggest that Jesus was not put off by either the man or the questions that he asked. In fact, the text says that the man treats Jesus very respectfully. He calls him teacher, and he engages him in a trial of a true seeker of wisdom. Jesus, in turn, treats him as an equal, responding to the lawyer's first question with a question, because that's what lawyers do. Rabbi, why do you answer all my questions with questions? Well, what else am I supposed to do? The rabbi responded. Jesus then tells the man a story after asking him two questions to test his knowledge of the scriptures. And then the man asks a follow-up question, and again, Jesus gives him an answer. There is something going on here that is quite wonderful in this conversation. The observation about the fact that the lawyer is not an antagonist is an important one for you to remember in this text. This is a well-known episode in the life of Jesus. It is only recorded in the Gospel according to Luke. And if we presume a contentious relationship between them, we're going to miss something. Luke's Jesus, when confronted by others, uh, argues within the limits of the rubrics of law. Jesus doesn't cast it away. This story arises out of the real world. Its perspective reveals that the relationship that Jesus had with religious authorities of his time, and it sheds light on his conversations with those religious authorities and with truth seekers, and those conversations echo down right to this very chapel today. The lawyer asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a seeker's question. What is a seeker's question? Well, it's a child's innocent inquiry into the color of the sky. Why is the sky blue? Our young daughter, Tracy, asked me that question when she was three or four years old. I remember the day, and I answered her in this way. Honey, the sky really has no color. We see sunlight scattered in the blue range of the spectrum as it strikes the gases and particulates in the atmosphere. There is no clean or clear break between the atmosphere and space. It might be more correct to say that there is no actual sky to speak of. Really, that's what I said to her. <laughs> and intrepidly, she said to me, yes, but why is the sky blue? It was like a Three Stooges episode. The lawyer asks an innocent and naive question. In reality, eternal life is not a commodity to be gained by one act or a series of actions. Eternal life is a freely given gift that comes from God. Jesus responds to the lawyer's question then with two questions. What is written in the Torah? What is it that you read there? Jesus wants to know what the lawyer, an expert in the law, actually himself sees in Torah. The lawyer cites a verse from Deuteronomy and one from Leviticus, two books of the Torah. They are fused together in a fabric, the sort of warp and woof of thought that come together, and the man answers. He gives the answer about loving God with everything that you are and loving your neighbor. And Jesus says to him, you have given the right answer, do this and you will live. But Jesus' questions about the law go deeper than the lawyer is able to go. Jesus has really asked him, are you able to see in Torah that the call to love extends both to neighbor and to those that we see as enemies? The lawyer is not seeing that in Torah, but Christopher Isherwood did. Christopher Isherwood is now a dead novelist. But in the 1930s, this gay, young Englishman had grown tired of the bleakness of Britain and took off for the more risque city of Berlin. And there he met a young German who became his lover. While they were there enjoying life in Berlin, uh, the circumstances of life began to change in Berlin. Changing from the risque capital now became the capital of National Socialism, of Nazism. In the relationship between Christopher and Heinz, it was clear that Heinz would have to soon wear a Nazi uniform, the uniform of the SS. It was clear already what Nazis were, what they were about, and what they did. And it was clear that Heinz had no choice but to do exactly what they did. This caused a crisis of conscience in life for Christopher Isherwood. He wondered. He wondered if he would be able to confront Nazism if he would be able to push the button that would destroy all Nazis in one blow. This man who he had seen as his neighbor now had become his enemy in everything that he valued. But he could not do it. 
He could not fight against the Nazis, so he fled, leaving Heinz behind and returning to Britain. So the lawyer follows up with a second question that demonstrates his desire to be right, to be right on this very important point. He has already answered rightly, Jesus said, but now he needs validation that he is quite right, that he is living righteously before God. And so he asks, in effect, if doing this, if loving God and loving neighbor as oneself is a matter of eternal life, then defining neighbor is important. And so he asks, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus does what a good teacher does. He tells a story. He tells the story that we know as the parable of the Good Samaritan. He tells the story about a neighbor. He tells a story that shows that our neighbor is the one we least expect to be our neighbor. The neighbor is the other, the despised one, the feared one, not someone who is like us. Jesus shifts the question from the one the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor, to whom a righteous neighbor is and what a righteous neighbor does. The lawyer doesn't ex object to Jesus' parable, and perhaps he senses that Jesus is actually answering his question quite well. How does a listener get into a story like this? How are we affected by it and by its tenets? We are invited to join the story, perhaps, by taking up with the priest, or taking up with the Levite, or we can enter into the story by imagining ourselves as the Good Samaritan. One of the things that I find so fascinating about this text is that we know everything about everyone in the story, demographically speaking, except the man who is on the ground. We know all the demographics we need to know. There is a priest, there is a Levite, there is a Samaritan, there is an innkeeper. They all have sort of demographic categories, but the man who is laying on the ground, we know nothing about him. He has just had his life beaten into an inch near his death. The priest and the Levite do the right things for themselves. Often people think that the priest and Levite see and then pass on by because they do not want to make themselves ritually impure. This is a mistake. The Torah gives a waiver for helping someone who may even appear dead or someone who is dead to help in the time of an emergency. That's not what their role is. Their role in the story is not to be lifted up to somehow amplify the goodness of the Samaritan by showing the cowardiceness or the selfishness of themselves. No, they stand up as people who do the right thing. They shouldn't be condemned for that. They do the right thing. The lawyer did the right thing. He gave the right answer. You know, it seems to me that the students who are graduating have been immersed in giving right answers for the last four years. That's what you've been about. You have become intoxicated in giving the right answers. In quizzes and exams and projects you've had to do, you have had to give the right answers. But now it is time for you to detox from giving right answers because giving right answers in the world in which you are going into is worthless. It is practically useless. You have to understand that people who pursue being right, particularly in intimate relationships, risk never really descending into an intimate relationship. People who pursue being right in politics risk never being relevant. And people who pursue being right in religion risk never ever knowing God. Yes, the priest and the Levite do the right thing. What does the Samaritan do? The Samaritan does the shocking thing. The Samaritan, the one who is not the Israelite, is the one who does not do the right thing. He becomes the right thing. In reality, this is all about verbs. The priest and the Levite see and pass by. There are only two verbs that describe them in the Greek in this text. They see and they pass by. But the Samaritan came near, saw, moved, went, bandaged, poured, put, took, took again, and gave 11 verbs. Do this, do this, and you will live. Not be this, be right. Being right never swabbed parched lips after surgery. Being right never spooned ice chips into the mouth of an AIDS patient who was dying. Being right never carried a sign in protest to support civil marriage rights for all people. Being right never answered a call on a hotline from a teenager who wanted to kill himself. Being right never bathed a spouse who has dementia. Being right never sat right next to a person who had cancer who was receiving chemotherapy. Being right is virtually worthless. It is useless. 
But doing right changes everything. The Samaritan put his verbs into flesh. His otherness disappears, it evaporates. So the only character left through which to enter the story perhaps is the one who has no identity at all, the one who has just had his life threatened. The lawyer understood Jesus' point. When you receive life-giving mercy, otherness ceases, and one experiences instead a common humanity. The lawyer perceived who his neighbor was and what it was like to be a neighbor, and Jesus' final words, go and do likewise, parallel the command following the first question, go, do this, and you will live. Too bad that the lawyer couldn't bring himself to name the neighbor. In answer to Jesus' probing question, which of these three was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers, all that the lawyer could say was the one. The one. He couldn't even say the Samaritan. He just said the one. Do you know the story of Elena Deladonna? Elena Deladonna is a masterful basketball player, a woman who stands well over six foot high, grew up in Delaware, attended Ursuline Academy when she was in high school, and she was the highest high school scoring basketball player in the country, I'll bet on the planet. She went immediately to UConn to play basketball. She arrived on campus, she was there for 38 hours, and then she left, and she went back home. She said she was just burned out from playing basketball. So she enrolled at the University of Delaware to play volleyball. And she played volleyball for a year, but late at night she asked the coach if it would be all right if she could go into the court and shoot some hoops. And all the time, there she was, working through everything. She was like the one who was on the road, half dead. She talked to the coach at the University of Delaware and said, I really want to come back and play basketball again. I really wasn't burned out. I left the University of Connecticut because I couldn't stand being away from home. She has a sister, an older sister named Lizzie. Lizzie was born blind. She can't see, she couldn't hear, cerebral palsy, can't communicate. She realized for the first time that her otherness was so dependent on the otherness of Lizzie. When she was at the University of Connecticut, she couldn't communicate with her sister at all. There was no way for them to communicate. She couldn't be a neighbor to her own sister. The otherness of the separation needed to evaporate, and so she made up a story. I don't like playing basketball anymore. She was just homesick. She was like on the road, half dead, until coaches and friends surrounded her like the Samaritan and picked her up and put her on a new road and healed her wounds. And she played well for the University of Delaware, and it's likely that she will be on the basketball team representing this country in London in 2012. For heaven's sake, go make your verbs flesh. The thing that changed everything for the half-dead man was the one verb, the Samaritan drew near. Please don't be afraid to draw near, to stand up for what you believe, and to make a difference. The love changes everything. And so does drawing near. I have one more thing that I'm not afraid to tell you. When you moisturize, don't forget to moisturize the back of your neck. (laughs) Really. I was invited to be a speaker at a conference where women were being honored, and I was introducing one of the first recipients. And the last thing I remember of the night is this is what I'm really afraid of, President, that they'll never remember who I am. I'm your penultimate voice. You still have an ultimate voice that's yet to come. But maybe someday you'll remember what this preacher said. Don't forget to moisturize the back of your neck. (laughs) It's very important. Now, live your life. Go change everything. And for heaven's sake, don't be afraid. God bless you all.